This is a workshop that I developed with my cohort in the Teaching Scholars Program at University of Washington. And I encourage anyone who doesn't know about the Teaching Scholars who's interested in focused education around medical education, consider applying to that program. Most of us get thrown into teaching. And the assumption is we can all teach. But actually, there are a lot of elements to teaching that are not intuitive. And it's helpful to be in a cohort of other medical educators learning about teaching. Because we are on TV or on YouTube, I would like to call attention to my email address. Because this is free, it's not copyrighted, I will give you my slide deck. You may take it, you may adapt it, you may make it work for you in whatever setting you're teaching or working. Because the point is for this to be widely available. I have no conflicts of interest, sadly to say, because I would love to be able to get more support for some of the work that I do. And as I said, this was first developed as a workshop by the Teaching Scholars Cohort in the year that I was in that cohort, 2005 to 2006. Each cohort has an opportunity to identify a problem or an issue to work on either individually as a, or as a group. And we felt that we didn't feel comfortable giving feedback to learners. We didn't know what we were doing. Most of us felt we did that very poorly. And so we undertook to understand exactly how to give better feedback. And we adapted material from quite a number of sources, some of which are listed on this slide. So my first question to the audience is, what do you hope to gain from today's workshop? And what are your expectations? Does anyone, aside from getting CME credit for coming to this? <laughs> well, um, I don't see a groundswell of questions. I will say I was asked to do this in part because the residents and fellows identified feedback as something they would like to have strengthened in the teaching program here. Some of them felt they weren't getting feedback, even though many faculty felt they were giving feedback consistently and frequently. So this is to try to alert people to how to give feedback, and also for the trainees, how to ask for feedback. So at the end of this workshop, I'm hoping that you'll be able to define feedback and differentiate it from evaluation. Speaking of which, please fill out the evaluation forms <laughs> and give me some feedback at the end. Define key components of what makes effective feedback. Identify barriers to giving feedback and to asking for it. And at, at the end of my talk, we're going to break out into some role playing scenarios. I will tell you, you can duck out and escape before the role playing. Most people dread it, and they don't want to do it. And our experience in doing this workshop many times is after gutting through it and deciding I'm going to be courageous enough not to pretend that my pager went off, people actually say it's the most useful thing in the entire session. So if you can, I encourage you to stay. Those of you who are watching remotely, I'm more than happy to send you some of the scenarios so that you can find a trusted group of people and practice doing some role playing. Perhaps ask people who've done it here to work with you, because it really is something that will make you more comfortable. Speaking from personal experience, the more you practice giving feedback, the more comfortable you are actually giving feedback. So again, you can email me and ask for the scenarios and the slide deck. You can write your own scenarios. You can modify the slide deck. So we're going to break out into some case-based scenarios, at which point the cameras will be turned off. So you will not be on candid camera when you're doing role playing. So what is feedback? Feedback is designed to influence, reinforce, or change behavior, concepts, or attitudes. So what we will do is I'm going to talk briefly about what, why, when, where, and how to give feedback. We're going to do some role playing under scenarios and then wrap it up. My demonstration will be giving some examples with myself, not role playing with any of you. So what's the difference? Well, you're going to fill out formal evaluation in a scheduled summative way, for example, at the mid-year or at the end of rotations. And that's like a grade. 
You take chemistry, you get a grade on a paper, you get a midterm grade, you get a final grade for the course. Feedback is not graded. Feedback is an attempt to give brief, focused, specific, formative, timely, on the spot information when you've observed a behavior or skill. And there could also be knowledge or attitude that needs reinforcement. And I would also say reinforcement in the good sense. Catch people doing things well as often as you notice things that they might improve. An example would be right after a clinical presentation or procedure. So the best time to give me feedback would be in the next hour or two or day or two after you hear this. A week from now, you won't remember the specific thing you wanted to share with me. And that's the most helpful time for me to get the feedback. I can change the slide or change the scenario for the next time I give this. So why should we give feedback? It might seem obvious to you, but actually there is some literature about this. Giving back to the learner provides opportunity for growth, ideally helps the learner or the colleague develop insight into his or her own behavior, allows the learner to reach self-defined goals. And in one review, it was ranked second out of 37 preceptor behaviors that trainees identified as something that most enhanced learning. It gives back to the teacher. It actually provides personal fulfillment, and I can say that from my own experience now. First of all, when I give specific, focused, timely feedback, the, the trainee recognizes that I care genuinely about them to try to help them learn right then and there. It also gives me feedback. I can very quickly see the trainee shifting gears and integrating and learning. It makes the entire teaching atmosphere extremely rewarding to have that dialogue, that interaction that is juicy, that is energetic, that is engaged. So it's strongly correlated with students' perceptions of effective teaching, but it's also correlated with teachers' experience of joy in the process of education. Giving back to the profession and the community, it contributes to development of competent physicians and I would say competent learners in any discipline. It emphasizes the importance of providing feedback and it highlights the skills of self-analysis and self-evaluation. And in one study where there was active feedback integrated into the training process, they observed improved chart documentation and quality of care on that service. It's also a requirement, by the way. Um, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education and the Residency Review Committee require it. Faculty must evaluate. Now, they're using the term evaluate, but timely manner, to me, implies feedback. The residency program must demonstrate that it has an effective mechanism for assessing resident performance throughout the program and for using the results to improve performance. Most importantly, when we don't give feedback, good behavior is not reinforced. Again, catch people and observe when they're doing things well. Mistakes go uncorrected and learners make assumptions. So if I say nothing, there are really two choices. No news is good news, I'm doing a great job, or they just think I'm hopeless. Because if I get no feedback, I assume you're indifferent, or you don't really care, or what I've done is, doesn't matter. And that is not something we can afford to foster in an education environment that is based on providing quality patient care. So what are the barriers to feedback? The most common, we polled the audience many times. We rolled this workshop out, and the teaching cohort that I was with have done this in many settings. And for a while, we would stop and ask the audience, what are the barriers? Today, because I'm on the recorded video, I'm not doing that. But the typical ones that we saw over and over again, number one was time. People think it will take too much time to stop and give feedback when they're teaching. Some of them think it's not going to have any value. It's Why bother? Also, frankly, to the trainees, if I give you feedback and you ding me on my evaluations that I'm picky, that I waste time talking too much about X, Y, or Z, 
That's often anonymized, but the chairs use that to promote us. They look at our teaching evaluation. So some faculty, honestly, are very afraid of giving any kind of constructive feedback to trainees because they're afraid of being hit back themselves in an anonymous fashion, unfortunately, because that's not my experience. My experience is the more feedback I give, the better my relationship with people, not the worse. Unclear performance ex expectations. So I know that Dr. Rainey has always been a champion for very clear goals and objectives. And I think in laboratory medicine, you have very good goals and objectives for most of the rotations. But I shouldn't be telling you you're not doing something that isn't part and parcel of what is the goal and objective of that particular experience. If I have concerns about that, I should be taking that to the curriculum committee and making sure there's a coherent buy-in by the program. So I'm not going to talk about something if it isn't part of the culture of what we're, as a group, trying to do and foster. Again, people are afraid of the teacher-learner relationship being abrogated. But the most important thing we also found, is, aside from time commitment, is most people have not had any training. They don't know how to do this. So I'm going to give you a model of how we decided worked for us. So first of all, it should be balanced. It should be requested or permitted. Do you have time for me to chat with you briefly now? It should be on the spot, very specific. And this is very key. The more specific you make it, the easier it is to talk about something. This is a well-stained slide. You did a great job of cutting this section. Very specific, no emotional content, but constant feedback on performance through the training session non-judgmental and objective. If a trainee is late to didactic, I must not assume that the trainee doesn't care about didactics or is lazy. I can only observe, I noticed that you were late to didactics. And I have learned that my assumptions about the motivation are very dangerous, because sometimes somebody may be dealing with a family illness. They may be dealing with a problem outside of work, their tire was flat. We all have things that come up. If I assume that I know why something happened, I'm going to go right down the wrong track. So it's much better to just simply say, take someone aside. I've noticed that you've been missing didactics for a couple of weeks. Let's talk about that. What's going on? Because what I find out from that question may unearth very important things that will improve my ability to help that learner be successful. Um, suggesting alternative behaviors. Sometimes there's no negotiation. There are certain things like call rounds that people need to be at call rounds. So if someone can't make it to call rounds or is missing call rounds, maybe it's a chance to talk about, well, let's how, how are you going to organize other things? Because this is very important to our program that you come to call rounds. So it gives an opportunity to talk about other structure or context to allow that learner to be successful. Owned by the sender. By that I mean I'm not going to transmit third-hand information that someone else observed and told so-and-so and told so-and-so that I'm then going to take to the learner. That's, again, a very dangerous. We've all played that game of telephone where the message gets transmitted. I'm going to try as far as I can to stick with what I personally have observed in a setting with the learner and checked by the sender for clarity. Um, so the goal here is to help the learner improve self-analysis, help the learner identify gaps in skill and behavior, help the learner uh, gain awareness of habits, shed light on unconscious attitudes, gain skill in developing learning strategies, set clearer and specific targets, outline resources, and hopefully work with us more effectively. So environment and context. Do you have a minute right now to talk to me? Why don't we go into my office or across the hall if you're in a busy clinic setting, for instance? Or define the process. I personally make it clear that during sign out, I'm going to be giving you constant feedback about every facet of each of your cases. And since we're in a multi-headed teaching environment, this is going to be openly discussed so that everyone around the microscope can also learn. Of course, if there are some elements that 
really need to be confidential. I'm going to talk about that in private. But a lot of the feedback, especially if it's positive, catching people doing good things continuously, that is just as important to bring out in the sign out setting. Now, many of you have learned the traditional sandwich method, where you tell something very positive. You mastered that procedure very quickly. And then you tell something negative. You seem to be making a lot of labeling errors, however. And then you tell something positive. But I'm sure that since you're a quick learner, you will soon decrease the errors. Um, we felt that this is not palatable. First of all, the person receiving that feedback is familiar with that, so they don't even hear the first positive. They're waiting for the negative. And then the most problematic thing about it, in my opinion, is it's passive. So the, if I were to define the most important thing about graduate medical education, it's about learning self-reflection and self-analysis. Nobody tells me what courses to sign up when I go to an annual meeting. No one tells me what articles I'm going to read in the morning when I drink my coffee. I have to figure that out myself. I have to figure out what I don't know, what skill sets I, I need to learn, sometimes based on feedback, but also based on self-analysis. So if we're not fostering the self-analysis of our learners, I think we're failing them. So tell, tell, tell does not engage that self-reflection and that problem-solving attitude. So our approach, and this is also in the literature, is the ask, tell, ask approach. Some of you may have seen in November, AJCP, American Journal of Clinical Pathology, the first article in the journal is by um, two members of the American Pathology Foundation who also give a workshop on feedback. And they also use the ask, tell, ask approach. So this is not something our teaching cohort developed. It's in the literature. So ask, how do you think your case workups for microscopic sign out are going? So then the learner will say something. And then the goal is non-judgmental -judge specific observation. Well, I agree things are going well. And you also appeared to have difficulty coming up with a differential diagnosis for that patient with abdominal pain and granulomas in the colonic biopsy. What do you think? So the next, is the next ask, what do you think would help improve your ability to come up with a differential diagnosis and plan for additional stains or studies? And then to another ask follow-up. Let me know when you need a couple minutes to collect your thoughts before you present a case to me tomorrow. I can also show you some online resources and teaching files you can use while you're working up your cases. So I'm going to work with the learner again. We're going to focus on that again. We're going to talk about resources and tools. Here's one that came out of the residency program. Um, how are your interactions with the laboratory staff going? Well, it sounds like you feel like you're getting along really well with people. I wanted to share with you that the histotechnologist on call was upset that you called him at 9 PM and directed him to cut your cases, your slides first. He tried to explain the laboratory protocol to you. And apparently, you told him, I am the doctor here. Um, can you outline some reasons why an experienced histologist on call might need to follow established procedures in the lab rather than responding to a resident's directives? So that particular trainee hadn't really thought that, A, the histologist on call was experienced, and B, there were laboratory procedures. And so that was an important question. Can you think of a different way that you might have approached a situation that seemed clinically urgent to you, but also might disrupt, disrupt well-established laboratory routines? You see this all the time in laboratory medicine. Can you think of anything else that might help your communication with other laboratory personnel so you don't get into friction around an important patient procedure or patient care issue? Sometimes it needs to be more specific. Can you review and summarize laboratory workflow procedures and discuss them with me or with us on call rounds? Why don't you practice with me? And I've done this. Why don't you practice with me how you might call the lab to request something unusual? But also reminding the learner of the target. You need to be respectful when making requests. And you need to understand whether or not your request is reasonable and practical. And sometimes very important to remind them that Laboratory personnel 
often know vastly more about what goes on in the lab than any of the physicians on staff. So they really need to understand that whole process involved. But none of these, I think most of you would agree, none of these, in none of these am I saying directly to the trainee that was inappropriate and rude. There's an objective way to actually move toward that that makes it very clear. And if I slammed that person from the very beginning, honestly, although I was tempted to, it would have, been, would have probably abrogated my ability to move to a better relationship with that learner who really wasn't, I don't think was really not trying to be arrogant, was feeling a sense of urgency, also didn't know it was possible to pick up the phone and page a physician, attending physician or a fellow to help negotiate that. But sometimes reminding people of how to call a friend. So helpful hints. It's also very, very important, in addition to the ask, tell, ask, to just say, I'm going to give you some feedback. Because it's amazing when people say, I get no feedback, and yet many of us are working with trainees for hours and hours. So I'm going to give you some feedback about this comment. I'm going to give you some feedback about the case you presented on call rounds. I'm going to give you some feedback about what I heard from how well you managed that call from a clinician in the hallway. Be very specific if you can. This section is well cut. What do you think about the staining quality? Frequent specific comments really do reduce the emotional impact of giving feedback and make it a lot easier to do it continuously through the day. And as I've said many times, provide positive feedback in addition to constructive feedback. I gave some feedback to an attending who wrote in an evaluation, good job. And I said, I'm very glad that you're making an attempt to give positive feedback to the trainee. Could you write two, two sentences instead of two words and tell the trainee what was good? Because good job by itself is very, very vague. Did they do a good job in their knowledge base? Did they good, do a good job in communicating to the lab personnel? Did they do a good job in differentiating two difficult fungal infections that look similar to each other? What was good about the job? Be specific, because that's actually what we all want. We want specific information. If there's one thing that characterizes the people in this room, you're passionate about getting better every day at what you do. So if all I hear is good job, I'm not going to have any grist for the mill to improve my ability to do a better job tomorrow. Um, ask for, now, for the trainees. If you're not getting enough feedback from me, please ask. So I'm asking you to give me feedback about my slides and the talk and the tone and the pace and the scenarios. If you're working with me, you can say, Melissa, what do you think about the comment that I wrote on that case? If you want to practice your talk for us, Cap, sit down with me and say, could you listen to my slides and have, make notes about each slide? When I did a talk at a national meeting, I asked residents to listen to my talk, and I asked them to take notes if they were willing and give me feedback about my talk. You can ask people to help coach you. You can pick in this room. There are people who are going to mentor you better about organization, people who are going to mentor you better about written English, people who are going to mentor you better about how to write a good grant. Steal from them actively. Go say, I'm going to learn from you, Dr. Cookson. How do you write a grant on microbial immunity? And that person will mentor you on that, but they're not going to just walk up to you and say, come on into my lab and learn how to write a grant. You can ask for the feedback. You can ask for the help. Um, so did I project my voice well enough? Did I allow an, anyone to share opinions at that meeting that I chaired? I can ask for feedback, and I can alert someone before I chair that meeting. Dr. Cherian, I'm going to be doing call rounds tomorrow. Are you going to be there? Could you give me feedback afterwards to make sure I covered what I needed to cover, stayed on time, and that people could act actually get their opinions across when I present? You can ask that. Mm -hmm.